Come on, bless the name of the Lord. Come on. You can do better than that. Can we bless the name of the Lord? How many know he's an awesome God? He is. He is an awesome God. He's an on-time God. He specializes in things that seem impossible. And he alone can do what no other power can do. I'm a living witness. I stand as a testimony that he'll heal you. How many know he's a healer? Thank you, Lord. I'm just so thankful to be back behind this sacred desk. Amen. Amen. I, sometimes, I said earlier, you don't know God is all you need until God is all you got. And um, sometimes we take for granted the goodness of God. And sometimes we forget that God can use anybody. And so whenever we are used by God, it's an honor, it's a blessing. And it's because of his grace and his mercy. And if I hadn't learned anything, I learned that in the past 30 days, I mentioned earlier, God has blessed me um, to be in, in the gospel ministry for 25 years. I have been preaching 25 years and pastoring 20 years. And I mentioned earlier, the past month was the first time in all of those years where I have gone a month without preaching God's word. And um, that was very challenging for me. As I said earlier, I believe it hurt my feelings more than it hurt anybody else. Um, and I also reflected on how good God has been to me. You know, um, 25 years preaching and 45 years of age and never had to spend a night in a hospital. Come on, somebody, and been able to stand week in and week out preaching God's word. So even as I was going through my challenges, I had to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for just being faithful. Thank you for just being God. Thank you for using me. And I thank God for my Olivet Church family. You all have been just a beautiful congregation. You all have prayed for me. You have just supported me and encouraged me. And um, I, I say this so much, and I really hope you know that I'm serious when I say it, but I prayed for a church like you. And um, you all are the answer to my prayers. Amen. And so I thank God for, I thank God for you and what you mean to me and to my family. Amen. And I just love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to uh, be around here long enough. And like you call Daddy Creasy, Daddy, you're going to be calling me Daddy Robinson. Amen. <laughs> Ain't nobody mad but the devil. Amen. I ain't going nowhere. Amen. I'm going to be here. Thank God for you, Mother Creasy. We're happy to see you back on today. We've been praying for you. Amen. And we praise God for, for your healing as well. God is truly a healer and a deliverer. That song was so appropriate this morning, just how awesome God is. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. 
Amen. Thank you. Don't our choir looks good? Don't they look good in their new robes on, on today? I believe God has a word for us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. and We're going to look at verses 16 through 18. And I just want to take my time this morning and Amen. I'm not trying to swing for the fences. I'm just trying to get on base. Amen. So pray, pray with me, pray, pray for me as God continue to, to restore me back to full health. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses 16 through 18, a familiar passage to many of us. I preached this earlier this year, this same text, but I want to preach it a different way. God gave me a new revelation in the past few weeks and led me back to, to this particular passage of scripture. It is one of the letters written by Paul. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. I want to talk from the subject this morning, two choices, two choices. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, two choices. During a flight from Portland, Maine to Boston, pilot Henry Dempsey heard a noise near the rear of his small aircraft. He turned over the controls to his co-pilot and went back to investigate. As he reached the tail section, the plane hit an air pocket, and Dempsey was tossed against the tail section. He quickly discovered the source of the noise the rear door had not been properly latched, and as it flew open, Dempsey was sucked from the jet. And seeing the light that indicated an open door, the co-pilot made an emergency landing. He reported that the pilot had fallen out of the plane and requested a helicopter to search for him in the waters below. And after the plane landed, they found Dempsey holding onto the outer ladder of the aircraft. Somehow, Dempsey had caught the ladder, held on for 10 minutes as the plane flew 200 miles per hour at an altitude of 4,000 feet and survived the landing. In fact, it took airport personnel several minutes to try to pry his fingers <laughs> from the ladder. And here is the moral of the story. The moral of the story is simply this. Sometimes the turbulence of life will place all of us in precarious situations where we only have two choices. 
either we can give up or we can hold on. And that's, all of that, pretty much the theme of this entire passage. Paul says to the church of Corinth, listen, you can either give up or you can hold on. As a matter of fact, verse 16 begins with an assertion. Paul says, so we do not lose heart. In other words, that's the theme of this passage. However, it's not just the theme of this passage, but it's also the theme of this particular chapter. For example, 2 Corinthians 4 and 1 starts off by saying, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. In other words, Paul argues here in this letter in this chapter that his faith in Christ enables him to live and minister with unwavering confidence. And then Paul ends the chapter where he began, he says, so we do not lose heart. And that verb translated lose heart simply means to be exhausted or spiritless or weary. It's the picture of a laborer literally in the field who becomes so exhausted that he quits his work. Or a soldier in a battle who becomes so discouraged that he retreats from the fight. So figuratively, the term means to grow faint-hearted to the point of giving up. And Paul is suggesting to the church at Corinth, no matter what you go through in life, don't ever give up on God. Even in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus teaches his disciples that men ought always to pray and not lose heart, not to faint. Paul says in Galatians 6 and 9, and let us not grow weary. In well-doing, for in due season, do I have some Bible readers here, we will reap if we faint not. In other words, if we do not lose heart. So when Paul uses this term here, he's really using it to testify about his own spiritual resolve. He says, so we do not lose heart. Because at the time of our text, would-be leaders in the church at Corinth challenge Paul's ministerial credentials, meaning they claimed that Paul was spiritually weak and that he experienced more suffering than he did success. However, Paul responds by agreeing <laughs> with his enemies and contends that his weakness is the platform for God's strength, and that his suffering is the platform for God's glory. And Paul says, listen, the proof of all of this is in the fact that in spite of everything I went through, I did not lose heart. And then he gives us a list of things that he went through in 2 Corinthians 11, 11 and 22 through 28. Paul records his sufferings for Christ. He says, and I quote, he says, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Paul says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. He says, three times I was beaten with rods, and once I was stoned, and three times I was shipwrecked. Paul says, a night and a day, I was at drift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Paul says, in toil and hardship. Through many, a uh, many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, Paul says, listen, I've often gone without food 
in cold and exposure and apart from other things, he says, there is this daily pressure on the inside of me and anxiety that I have for all the churches that I oversee. Now, all of that, the truth of the matter is a fraction of these sufferings would cause most of us to give up. Can I get a witness here? I, I told him earlier, you can, I can just stop right there where it says he received 39 lashes. Come on, somebody, because if you beat me 39 times, I'm ready to give up. <laughs> Come on, somebody. But Paul went through all of that. Paul says, listen, in spite of all of that, I did not lose heart. And, and Olivet, let me say this, Paul's relentless spirit was not the result of his personal fortitude, meaning Paul was no superman. However, spiritual realities undergirded Paul's faith. And I discovered that these same spiritual realities are available to all of us who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ on today. Now, the reality is most of us will never face the variety, intensity, and severity of sufferings that Paul endured. And the church said, however, we all have faced or will face quitting points that tempt us at times to lose heart. Another way to say it is faith does not prevent this temptation. I mean, the reality is all of us who follow Christ will face overwhelming circumstances that will tempt us sometimes to lose heart, and we have no control over it. However, we can control how we respond, meaning we can either give up or we can hold on. Two choices, give up or hold on. And, and 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 gives us three reasons this morning as to why we should hold on no matter what we go through in life. And the first reason we should hold on, church, is because of the process of inward renewal. The process of inward renewal. Verse 16 says, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away our inner self is being renewed day by day. Now, now notice there is a uh, contradictory process taking place within us. Paul says, he says, the outer self is wasting away. And this outer self is, is one of several ways that Paul here describes one's physical life in this chapter. No, notice in verse 7, he calls the outer self, he refers to it as jars of clay. And in verse 10, he calls it the body. And then verse 11, he calls it our mortal flesh. However, here in verse 16, Paul refers to it as the outer self. And this term refers, refers to life in our physical bodies. Paul says in no uncertain terms, he says, listen, life in our physical bodies is wasting away. And, and church, it's possible that Paul wrote this with reference to the toll his labors for Christ and battles for the gospel had taken on him. However, this statement primarily refers to the present constant and inevitable process of physical deterioration that every person must experience. Let, let me say it in a way that you understand it. The songwriter would say it this way, this old building keeps on leaning. And one of these old days, come on somebody, I'm going to have to move to a better home. And you know, uh, Deacon Miller, the more birthdays I have and the more funerals I do as a pastor, I realize we didn't come here to stay. Come on, somebody, but there's a leak in this old building. And one of these old days, do I have some witnesses here? We got to move to a better place. Paul says our outer self is wasting away. Even in Genesis 3 and 19, the Lord said to Adam, he said, by the sweat of your face, 
You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In other words, this is the fate of every descendant of Adam and Eve. The outer self is always wasting away. And it's not so obvious when you're young. Because when you're young, you're so full of life. Come on, somebody. And health and strength and vitality and hope. I mean, you just feel like you're going to live forever. Come on, somebody. But, but even young people are wasting away. That's why Ecclesiastes 12 and 1 says, remember also the creator in the days of your youth before the evil day come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. And church, let me be clear on this Sunday morning. This is not a conditional thing that only applies to the old or to the sick or to the weak, but this process is happening in all of us right now. All of us will waste away. In fact, the scientific terms is apoptosis, and it simply means the process by which 50 through 70 billion cells die in the average adult every day. In other words, the outer self is wasting away. And there's nothing you can do to stop the process. You can diet. <laughs> you can exercise. Come on, somebody. You can live right. And as stewards of these God-given bodies, we should do all of those things, especially if you're going to have inequality to your life. However, the fact still remains, none of these things will put to a halt our steady march to the grave. In other words, all of us will someday die. Can I get a witness up in here? And let me ask you this. When you die, will you be ready to meet him? That, that's, why, that's why it's so funny when I hear people say I'm getting older and not better. Now, that's cute. It sounds good. I'm getting older or I'm getting better and not older. And that's cute. But the truth of the matter is the outer self is wasting away. And I know that in this cosmetic culture we live in, we like to nip and tuck to give the illusion of youth and beauty and vitality. But the reality is we are still wasting away. The Bible says, from dust you came and from dust you shall return. Even Isaiah 40 and 8 reminds us that the word of God is the only thing that will stand forever. But not only is the outer self wasting away, but Paul suggests that the inner self is being renewed. Notice he says again, verse 16, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. No, notice he describes his outer self as wasting away, meaning physically Paul was becoming old, he was becoming tired, he was becoming weak. And this process, understand, was intensified and accelerated by his sufferings for the Lord Jesus Christ. However, here is the paradox. While his outer self was wasting away, his inner self was being renewed day by day. Another way, another way to say it is physically, Paul was facing death, but spiritually, Paul was enjoying life. In other words, a, a moral transformation was taking place underneath Paul's exterior. He was being renewed. New life was growing as his mortal life was dying. And Paul says this process of, of inward renewal was being repeated. He said day by day. Michelangelo said it this way, the more the marbles waste, the more the statue grows. Again, physically, Paul was facing death, but spiritually, he was enjoying life. And let me say this, the only way, church, that you can face death, yet enjoy life at the same time, is if you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get some witnesses here? See, the truth of the matter is, anybody can enjoy life when things are going well. 
Anybody, come on, can enjoy life when their health is prospering. Anybody can enjoy life when there's no sickness in their body. But it takes somebody who has a relationship with God who can praise him even when the bottom of their life is falling out. Who can come to church even when their eyes are filled with tears. Who can still tell the devil, I still will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth church physically Paul was facing death but spiritually he was enjoying life and I believe that's where some of you are on this Sunday morning physically you may be tired physically you may have sickness in your body physically you may have medicine on your, your sink counter but spiritually you're living your best life can I get a witness here spiritually you don't look like what you've been through Look, 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 at, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through, but whatever it is, you don't look like, come on, tell them what you're going through, because spiritually, you've learned how to hallelujah. <laughs> Anyhow. But, but not, only, not only should we, we hold on because of the process of of inward renewal, but secondly, we should hold on because of our preparation for future glory. Pa Paul says, verse 17, for this light momentary affliction, notice what he says, is preparing for us, preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Yeah. Now, notice this verse gives us four important facts about affliction and here's the first thing affliction is real let church say affliction is real as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact affliction literally means pressure it, it is not what we would call stress however it is life-threatening faith-stretching soul-crushing pressure for example it's the picture of a burden being placed literally on a person that can literally crush the life out of them. The Bible also refers to it as trials or troubles or tribulations that can pressure the believer. Now, don't miss that. Christians face affliction. Let me say that again. I said Christians face affliction, meaning we face affliction in spite of our devotion to Christ as a matter of fact, I would dare to say we face affliction because of our devotion to Christ. Hear me today. You can be saved and still get laid off from your job. Are you praying with me? You, you, you can be saved and still have a child who's strung out on drugs. You, you can be saved and still have sickness in your body. You can be saved and still go through trials and troubles and tribulations. Problems don't stop just because you're saved. Sometimes God will send problems to you because a faith that has never been tested is a faith that can never be trusted. Je Jesus said in John 16 and 33, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have it. So you, my dad used to say, son, you might as well make up your mind. You will have tribulation. Look at your neighbor and say, make up your mind. You will have tribulation. Even in the church, I know Job said, man, that is born of a woman, or born of a few days, and they're full of trouble, and Job is right, and we have trouble on our jobs, and trouble at home, and trouble in school, and we say, oh, if I make it into the church, everything going to be all right, but let me tell you something. You come in here, you're going to find trouble here too. Come on, somebody. You will face affliction wherever you go. Now, don't make me get too loud this morning. You, you're going to face affliction wherever you go. But, but not only is affliction real, but affliction is light. Let church say it's light. Pa Paul also describes affliction in verse 17 as being light, being light. And, and again, I know this appears to be a contradiction because we just define 
affliction as the pressure of a burden that is so heavy that it can literally crush you. However, Paul says it is light. And the question is, how can affliction be light? Well, the Greek term for affliction is only used twice in the New Testament and is used in Matthew 11 and 30 where Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden, come on somebody, is light. In other words, the Lord gives burdens. I love this, but his burden is light. I told you once before, I don't know anything about farming, but I do know this. Most farmers never put two strong mules together by themselves or two weak mules together by themselves. However, they will yoke a strong and a weak mule together because the strength of one will compensate for the other. Well, I discovered it's the same way with the burden of Jesus, meaning his burden is light because he always carries the heavy part. <laughs> to tell your neighbor, he always carries the, the heavy part. In other words, if the burden of trusting the Lord Jesus Christ seems too heavy for you to bear this morning, it could be because you're trying to carry it on your own. But I dare somebody, help me, Holy Ghost, to turn it over to Jesus. <laughs> And if you turn it over to Jesus, you'll discover that he alone can do what no other power can do. He can do what the doctors can't do. He can do what the lawyers can't do. He can do what the counselor can't do. He can do what the judge can't do. If you just turn it over to Jesus, he will work it out. No burden is too heavy if you learn how to lean and depend on Jesus, but not only is affliction real, not only is affliction light, but affliction is also momentary. Let church say momentary. In other words, affliction is but for a moment. <laughs> now, now, this is no quanda, this is no guarantee that your troubles will be brief. Contrary to popular belief, some burdens you may have to carry for years or even decades or even a lifetime, Moses said it this way in Psalm 90 and 10. He said, the years of our lives are 70 or, 70 or even 80 by reason of strength, yet their span is but tall and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. But, but here's the thing. However, we know that in Christ Jesus, we have the assurance that what trouble don't last always. Now, I can't tell you how long it'll last. I, I, wish, I, I'm look, I wish I could just, you know, give you an aspirin and say, take this, and in the morning your trouble will be over. Take this, and your child will be back home in three days. Take this, and your marriage will be saved in five days. I wish I could tell you how long trouble will last, but I can't tell you how long it will last, but I can tell you it won't last always. I'm so glad. Come on, y'all help me here. I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. This too shall pass. Let me see if I can explain it this way. A father makes his daughter spend the afternoon practicing the piano, and she would rather be anywhere in the world, but the father makes her stay at the piano rather than going outside to play because he knows that struggle today will produce music tomorrow. And maybe that's why God is taking us through some things in life. Maybe that's why he's taking us through some trials and tribulations because he knows the struggle we go through today will present something great tomorrow. Do I have some witnesses here? The more you go through. That's why Paul said, I want to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. In other words, Paul was saying, he's saying, listen, the more I go through, the better I know him. See, see, a lot of us, we just have a head knowledge of who he is. We, we just have some assent of who he is. We have, a, but it's a difference between a head knowledge and a heart knowledge of who God is because when you have a heart knowledge, you can say, you can't make me doubt because I know too much about him. And, and that's when you can say, I know him for myself. I'm not talking about what grandmama 
did and how she knew him and how granddaddy. But sometimes God will allow you to go through certain things so he can build your testimony where you can tell people, listen, I've been sick, thought I wasn't going to get well, but let me tell you what he did. He healed my body and now I got a story to tell and I never shall forget what the Lord has done for me. Sometimes he allows you to go through things so you can tell people, listen, I was broke and down to my last dime, but let me tell you how he opened doors for me and how he supplied all of my needs and I've never seen the righteous forsaken neither seen his seed begging for bread sometimes he'll take you through some things so he can build your testimony see the songwriter said mama may have and Papa may have, but God bless the child that has his own. And too many of us, we, we've been quoting other people's testimonies, but God said, let me give you your own story. And in order to have a testimony, you got to have a test. And a lot of us, we want the ammoni, but we don't want the test. <laughs> but tell your neighbor, tell your neighbor, no test no testimony if you don't go through something you won't have a story to share but but not only is affliction real not only is affliction light and not only is affliction momentary but then here's the next thing affliction is also productive paul says for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison now, notice Paul is not saying that suffering produces salvation. That's not what he's saying. Because Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 is real clear. Paul says in Ephesians, for by grace have you been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast or brag. See, understand affliction is not the way to heaven. Christ is the way. However, I, I need to tell you, there is a heavenly reward to be won or lost. As a matter of fact, 2 John 8 says it this way, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Another way to say it is present affliction is spiritual preparation for future glory. And this is why we do not lose heart. Text says our light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. In other words, if we only knew Olivet what God was preparing for us through the troubles that we have to trust him through right now, we wouldn't worry so much. Come on, somebody. We wouldn't complain so much. We wouldn't be so quick to give up because it's no comparison. Another way to say it is what you're going through cannot be compared to what God has prepared. Yeah. Romans 8 and 18 says, for I consider that the present sufferings of this present time are not comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. But church, not only should we hold on because of the process of inward renewal and our preparation for future glory. But last and certainly not least, we should hold on because of our perspective of eternal realities. But verse 18 says, and I'm going to my seat, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are what? Unseen. Now, that word look here does not mean a casual glance. Alan Redpath wrote, it is the word you would use if you were to pick up a telescope and try to bring something far away into view and into focus. It's a word that suggests an intense examination, a constant scrutiny, a steady gaze. A another way to say it is, church, the only way we can endure affliction is if we keep focusing on the invisible rather than focusing on the visible which means the first thing we have to do is focus on invisible realities. Focus on invisible 
realities. Let church say invisible realities. We look not to things that are seen, but to things that are. Now, the distinction here is not between mature Christians and carnal Christians, but it's between Christians and non-Christians. In other words, what Paul is trying to suggest is unbelievers look to the things that are seen. However, Christians walk by faith and not by sight. See, the reality is if you only look at what you can see, you will inevitably lose heart. See, strength to endure comes to those who look to things that are unseen. First Peter 1, 8 through 9 says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy, inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In other words, Christians don't look at what they can see, but we're walking by faith and not by sight. The Christians always in war with the facts and the faith. There's always a pull between what the facts say and what faith says. See, see, the facts say that I'm sick and I'm dying with cancer. But faith says by his stripes, <laughs> I'm already here. The facts say I'm I just got laid off from my job and I'm down to my last dime. But faith says, but my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The facts say I have a big old mountain standing in front of me and I don't know how I'm going to climb up that mountain, but faith says mountain, you gotta get out of my way. All I have to do is speak to the mountain and the mountain shall be moved. There's always a pool between facts and faith. And I need to ask you on this Sunday morning, whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the doctor's report? Or are you going to believe the report of the Lord? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm believing in the report of the Lord. Yes, sir. Let me see if I can explain it this way. In 1937, Walt Disney released the first full-length animated movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And Disney artists drew over one million pictures, and each picture flashed on screen for one twenty-fourth of a second. And watching at regular speed, the moviegoer had no clue to the amount of work that went into it. And I said all that to say because I discovered our lives are the same way, like that movie, meaning the Lord has put all of that infinite thought and skill and attention into every detail of our lives. And as life runs at regular speed, we cannot see what God is doing. However, we have to trust God is at work in our lives, even when we can't track him, even when we can't trace him, even when we can't trail him, we got to trust him. But not only do we focus on invisible realities, but we also focus on eternal realities. I'm closing, but when you look at this passage, it's filled with paradoxical statements. Paul says the outer self is wasting away as the inner self is being renewed day by day. That's a paradox. Then he says our light momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's another paradox. Then he says, in the meantime, we do not look to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. That's another paradox. And then verse 18, Paul ends with one more paradox. He says, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And church, this is why we do not look to things that are seen because everything we see 
is transient, meaning it relates to time. It's only temporary. That, that's why Matthew 19 and 26 asked the question, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? and then lose his soul because all of that stuff is just temporary. See, 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 in God's economy, the greatest value is attached to that which will last forever. If you don't believe me, Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says it this way, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal, but lay up, Jesus says, for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. In other words, we don't look to things that are seen because the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That, that's why the Bible says eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of men the good things that God has in store for us. That's why I tell folk, don't, don't get too excited about that Cadillac you're driving. Because eyes have seen the Cadillac. Come on, somebody. Don't, don't get too excited about that house you live in because eyes have seen the house. But God says, what I have for you, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. And neither has it entered into the heart of men. That's why you can't build your life around your stuff. Because that can be seen. I don't care what kind of car you buy. I mean, it really don't matter. One day, all of our cars are going to end up in the junkyard. Can I get a witness here? I don't know no car that lasts forever. I don't care what kind of clothes you wear. You can, God can bless you to get out of Croker sacks. And now you can get, you know, Fifth Avenue sacks. And you wearing Gucci and Armani and Tom Ford. The moth one day is going to eat up all of our clothes. You can't build your life around that stuff. I told them earlier, you can't even build your life around your mind. I'm looking at some of you, and you're so brilliant, you're so bright. I'm looking at you can comprehend, you can apprehend, you can illuminate, you can elucidate, you can retain. Come on, you can exegetically expostulate. But let me tell you something, your mind has a way of playing tricks on you. Look at how y'all looking. I, I've seen folk looking for their keys and they were right in their hand. Come on, talk back to me. I've seen folk looking for their glasses and they were sitting right on top of their face. I've seen folk looking, come on somebody, for that walk in a room and forgot what they walked in there for and had to turn right back around and go in the other room and hope something would jog their memory of what they wanted in the first place with their smart selves. You can't build your life around all that stuff. Build your hopes on things eternal. I'm finished, but the story is told of how one day a shipwrecked sailor was seized by the natives and hoisted on their shoulders and carried to the village and set on the throne. And he later learned that it was their custom once each year to make someone king for a year, and he liked that. I mean, he liked that idea until he began to wonder what happened to all the former kings. <laughs> he later discovered that every year when their kingship was ended, the king was banished to an island where he starved to death. But this sailor who was king for a year was wise. He put his carpenters to work making boats and his farmers to work transplanting fruit trees to the island and growing crops and his masons to work building houses. So when his kingship was over, he was banished not to a barren island, but to an island of abundance. And all of that, the moral of the story is simply this, don't invest your life in stuff that is temporal. The here and the now. Don't trade your life for temporary things, but invest in that which will last forever. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold 
to God's unchanging hand. I'm through, but that's all I came to tell you. You got to hold to his hand. You have to invest in God because all of these other things will let you down. But only what you do for Christ, only what you do for Christ will last. Come on, stand to your feet and give God a hand of praise. Come on, build your hopes. you haven't established a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want this opportunity to pass. I don't want you to leave here today not giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Only what you do for Christ will last. I've just been sent here today to remind you that your money won't last. Material possessions won't last. You can have all the finer things out of life. You can even live to a ripe old age. But only what you do for Christ will last. And if you haven't made a decision for him today, today is a good day. Let me tell you something. Life won't be easy with Christ. So I can't imagine going through this life, come on somebody, with, without Christ. You can still have storms. If you remember when the disciples were on the ship and a storm arose and, and Jesus was on the, the Bible says, behind the part of the ship asleep which is a lesson right there. The disciples went to wake him up. Here's the lesson. If Jesus is sleeping in your storm, why you up? Amen. Now that's, if he ain't worried about it, why you? But here's the point I'm making. The storm arose, but Jesus was on the ship with them. 
And here's the lesson. You can have Jesus on your ship and still have to go through storms. Come on, somebody. It may be a financial storm. It may be a relational storm. It may be a physical storm. But even with Jesus, you will have, you will have storms. You're either in a storm, just come out of a storm, or you're headed for a storm. But here's the, the key. You don't have to go through it by yourself. You don't have to go through it. There is one. J.D., I want, it's a song we haven't done in a long time. There is room at the cross. I know it's not Easter, but that's a good song to sing right now. There's room at the cross. And I feel like somebody needs to hear that this Sunday morning. There's room at the cross just for you. There is room at the cross for you. There is room at the cross for you. Oh, millions, millions have come would say, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Thank you. 